Thanks very much. So I want to start by reviewing the work of Drinfeld and Laforg and Laforg on Stukas, because that's going to inspire what we're going to try to do for piatic fields. So this first section. This work of Drinfeld and Laforg, V. Laforg. Although I will really just focus on Drinfeld for today. So the notation I want is k, a little lowercase k, will be a global function field. All right, and I'll let fq be its field of constants. And of course, a global function field determines a smooth projective curve over fq. But I'm going to note this by u rather than x, because I want to save x for later. q is the thing which corresponds to k. Okay. And uh, I'll review the definition of a stuka over u. So. Here it is. Okay. So it's a relative notion. You need an FQ scheme S. All right. So this definition won't be perfectly precise, but I don't want to give you lots and lots of notation. So let's say a Stuka over S as a vector bundle. So a locally free module over the structure sheaf. And it's over, so I'll call it L, and it lies over the product U cross S. And this product is taken over spec FQ. Uh, together with a morphism, so it's a Frobenius semilinear morphism from L to L, so I'm going to call that phi L. So L, we have L here, and I pull it back through the morphism 1 on U cross the Frobenius on S. Pull back. So Frobenius on S, this will always mean the Q's power, where Q is that Q. Frobenius from S to S, yes? And uh, so this morphism goes from L to L, but it's not defined on all of U cross S. So it's defined generically. And it is an isomorphism away from some points which come bundled in with the data of the, Stuk the Stuka S. So generically. So I really could write it like this. Eta cross S here. Eta, ah, yeah, so eta U. Eta U will be the generic point of U. Of U. And this will be an isomorphism. So there are zeros and poles of this stuka, of this morphism, which at some finite list of points, and these points are S points of U. OK. So these are morphisms from S to U. So I'm not being so precise here. What I really mean is there are zeros and poles at the graphs of those points. If I have a morphism from S to U, its graph is this uh, subscheme of U cross S, and that's where I mean it has its zeros and its poles. OK. OK. So Drinfeld introduced this concept in his study of the Langlands correspondence for GL2 over K. And he was able to prove very impressively that the Langlands correspondence existed um, by going in this crucial direction automorphic to Galois. He did this by studying the cohomology of a moduli space of Stuckers like this. So for Drenfeld, um, in Drenfeld's scenario, um, you have one zero and one pole. What did I call the zero? I'll call the zero Q. 
and one simple pull, pull P. And um, generically what this means, I can now state this, what this VL is doing, as long as P and Q are distinct, which happens generically, uh, this, phi, this phi sub L is doing this. It's an uh, isomorphism uh, of this pullback twist by P minus Q. And then it really is a morphism to find over X, X cross S, so to find over U cross S like this. So we see it's supposed to have a pole. It's allowed to have a pole at P and a zero at Q, and this is really going to be an isomorphism then. Okay. Um, so that was Drinfeld's original situation here. So he considered the moduli stack of these objects, these Ls, um, where the P and the Q really are allowed to vary. So. Stack, so I called this MD. of Stuckers in this situation, where there's one simple zero and one simple pull, um, where the D, what? Huh? Okay. Um, where the D is the rank of L. Okay. And uh, this thing, uh, so I mean, I can just forget about the L and focus and just uh, capture the P and the Q, and this gives a morphism from MD to U cross U. like this, and this is supposed to be a local analog, a long function field analog of a Shimura variety. Um, so as such, we expect a whole tower of these moduli stacks given by adding level structures. So just like with a Shimura variety, you can add level structures, you can add a level structure to, M to MD and get something sitting over it, which I'll call MDD. <laughs> so this capital D is supposed to be a divisor. No, I should really write this way. Sorry. So MDD is the stack of Stuckers together with a level structure D. What does that mean? It means you take L and you trivialize it on D. Of the restriction of L to D. And then this is fibered over, so you don't want D to collide with the zero and the pole of L. So, uh, yes, I didn't say it, but it's true. So the trivialization, yeah, so there's some obvious diagram that has to commute, which relates the trivialization that you choose with the, this phi L morphism. Yeah. So this is fibered over U cross D, U minus D cross U cross D. Like so. Okay, yes. Thanks. So, oh, the question was, doesn't, this ha doesn't the trivialization have to be compatible with the morphism phi L? And the answer is yes, it does, but I did not write it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, as in the case of Shimura varieties and characteristic zero, um, we want to create Gala representations. So, we look at the cohomology of these spaces. Um, so in, this is fibered over U cross U, so you would hope that you get a representation of the Galois group of K cross the Galois group of K. So in the end, this is indeed what's going to happen. So um, mm, let me actually call this. Yeah, so actually, I, I really only need the generic points of everything. So what I'll do is I'll only consider, I'll kind of rename MDD as the generic fiber of this thing over, over the point, which is the generic fiber of U cross U. Let me call this thing. I'll call this thing projection. So U cross U is an integral scheme, so it has a generic point, and I'm going to call that eta U cross U. So it's just the spectrum of a field, which is the fraction field of K cross K over FQ, or K tensor K over FQ. Okay. Um, so the natural thing to do is to pass the cohomology. So let's say I take the derived push forward of the constant sheaf on Q QL here. Okay. So this is the sheaf on what? Okay. So um, 
if it's a this thing here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Drinfeld does some labor to compactify this thing first. Yeah. This is really what I ought to be doing. So this gives you a chiffon uh, a to u cross u. And um, in other words, this is going to be a representation of an l adic representation of the Atal fundamental group of a to u cross u. Um, but an important warning here is that this fundamental group of the product of the two curves is not at all the same thing as the product of the two fundamental groups. So Drinfeld has to deal with this issue. In the end, what we really want is one of these guys, because after all, this is the Galois group GK, the Galois group of key, well, the Galois group of k bar over k, which is the thing we're ultimately interested in. So we really would like a representation of this guy. So how do you pass from here to here? And so Drinfeld introduces a thing which is now called the partial Frobenius. So uh, here's an important lemma. And I think V. Laforgue even uses the phrase fundamental lemma of Drinfeld for this thing. OK, um, so I'm going to write it this way. So uh, we have here the generic point eta u cross u. It's the spectrum of a field. Um, I could consider finite etala algebras over that. Um, so those are not the same thing as etal algebras over the product, over each one. But if you add a little bit more structure, so if I consider those finite etal covers of this point, which are equivariant for the action of phi cross 1. That's why it's a partial for Abenia. So I'm going to put this little notation here to mean that these are finite etal covers equipped with uh, an equivariance by phi u cross 1. Um, then this is going to be the same as uh, finite etal covers of u cross finite etal covers of u. Okay. So this lemma is not hard to prove, but it turns out it's going to be crucial to extend this to a situation in characteristic zero. Okay. Um, so that means that uh, uh, we can actually get a representation of GK cross GK as soon as we introduce this partial Frobenius equivariance into this picture. So what we do is we look, um, say just in this picture, say, and we find um, a morphism like this, so m upper d to m upper d. And this is supposed to lie over the partial Frobenius map on u cross u. Like that. So, um, OK, so but this is quite easily done. So what is this map here? So. Uh, I need to tell you where L goes. So in my formulation here where I wrote it, I believe that L just goes to L of minus P. Right. Yeah. OK, like so. And then you do a little exercise to see that you get a natural candidate for what phi L should be on this side. OK. Um, but that's not very difficult. So because we have Drinfeld's lemma, and because we've got an isomor uh, amorphism like so, it gives you this equivariant action of phi u cross 1 on the sheaf, on this sheaf right here. So really, you get a representation of VK, gk cross gk. Um, in the situation here, you get something unramified outside of d. But what we're going to do anyway is just take a limit over all d to get something with an adelic action. So in the d equals 2 case, Um, we get a representation, uh, which I'll just call V. V. This kind of limit. All right, so this is going to be the middle cohomology of this derived PRD lower shriek of, let's do QL bar this time. And this is a representation of, OK, so because we've added level structure at infinity, all right, so sorry, this is a, direct limit over all divisors. The divisors are getting broader. There's more and more points, but they're also getting deeper. The points are getting more and more multiplicity. So this, uh, OK, by the usual, this is sort of a priori, it has this action of GL2 
Okay. A dels of k. Okay, by the usual thing. Um, but it also has this gk action. Let's write it out this time. Okay. And Drinfeld's theorem is that, well, the cuspidal part of this guy is a direct sum of cuspidal representations which are automorphic on GL2AK of pi itself. Uh, tensor product, and now we need a representation here. And the way that it works is sigma of pi tensor of sigma of pi a dual. No, dual is written this way. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. So in doing so, this is how Drinfeld constructs the direction pi to sigma of pi. He sees that it is something of this form. Okay. So far, so good. So, um, uh, all right. So do this. So this suggests a program for GLN anyway, where we just let, uh, instead of rank two, just general rank. And this is the program carried out by Laurent Laforgue. Where's the eraser? No, oh, there's one right here. <laughs> so, uh, um, all right, so carried out the program completely for GLD for any D, thus establishing the Langlands correspondence for GL2, GLD over a function field. And then very recently, Vincent Laforgue uh, made an extremely general construction of, of G-Stuckers, of spaces of G-Stuckers, where G is a reductive group over K. And I'll definitely not say much about this in detail, but I'll only say that um, so this G is this group, so this vector bundle L has to get replaced by a G bundle. And the data of the zeros and poles gets replaced by, okay, so you're measuring how much this fails to be an isomorphism by giving these co-characters of G, which correspond to representations of the dual group. Um, and those representations show up here. So here there was a zero and a pole, and that corresponds to sort of standard representation tensor dual of standard. Yes. Oh, sure, 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 sure. But, uh, oh, yeah, but then it gave the analysis of the cohomology of them, I should say. And it is very complicated. Oh, the question was, so I've been corrected that Lefort didn't give the, con for the original construction of G. Stuckers, but rather that he ana analyzed, gave this analysis of their cohomology. Not the cohomology? He says he might be able to do it, says Sophie. <laughs> okay. He did not calculate the cohomology of the moduli stack of G Stuckers exactly. Yeah. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's not yet. <laughs> it's work in progress. Okay. Um, okay, so I should mention, so the way this is going is that I want to give a local construction of these guys for piadic fields, but I should first mention what happens in the local situation in equal characteristic. Ah, right. Um, so one can consider this. Uh, all right, so let's pass from the global to the local situation. So that means that you the projective curve gets replaced by one of its completions at a point. Um, so you can't consider a local version. Where U gets replaced by, um, well, I want to be like a puncture disk, around, like a formal puncture disk around a point of X. Um, so it's basically going to be a Laurent series field around T, but it, I want to do everything analytically and everything on the generic fiber. So the right way to do that is using attic spaces. So this attic space is just a point. And so by the way, I use a certain abbreviation here. What I mean by this is this pair. But whenever I have a valued field, I'm just going to write SPA of the field for SPA of this pair. It's just one point. Okay. 
And then, um, so you can give essentially the same definition of a stuka over U, sorry, a stuka over S, over S, and S here would be an attic space. And the attic space a priori has nothing to do with U, it just is over FQ. It's abstract. <laughs> would then be um, a vector bundle L on U cross S, and this U cross S is happening over FQ, um, over spa FQ, that is. Uh, and then you add whatever data you need to, because this thing still has a Frobenius, it's in characteristic P, so we're okay. Um, and I'm not going to say much about this, but uh, you can construct moduli spaces of such things, which uh, would be the characteristic P analog of Rapoport zinc spaces. Um, I just want to <laughs> write down one thing which will help maybe understand what goes on in the future. So, yeah, note, if I have some complete valued field, Um, well, I want to understand something about this product, the way this product works. Um, yes? Oh, yeah, moduli spaces together with uh, morphism to something on the special fiber. So there's... Correct, okay. All right, the point was that there... Okay, the analog of Rapport zinc spaces, Sophie points out, is not quite moduli of such things, but deformation spaces of such things, and she's, she's correct. Okay. So, um, so if K over QP is a complete valued field, I just want to write down this one fact. So if, um, when I take spa FQT over FQ, the spa K, okay, this is one point and this is one point, but the product of these two points is uh, most certainly not one point. So, in fact, it's a... Uh, so, I'll write the thing as D star over K, and this is the punctured disk. Over K, and I'll write it in a few ways. So, I mean, this is a rigid space over K, and this is going to be essentially the... Um, Yeah, the punctured unit disk, everything where t goes from 0 to 1 as a rigid space. It's over k. It's not affinoid, it's not compact. And I'd like to write this a different way, which is going to help us later. Um, this has to do with the generic fiber of a formal scheme. So the formal scheme I'm going to write down is the formal spectrum of OK, double brackets t. Um, to any formal scheme, I can form its corresponding attic space. That's a set of all continuous valuations on this guy, which are bounded by one. Um, and then I can take its generic fiber over K, meaning I only consider those absolute values, or those valuations, uh, whose value on a parameter of K, on a uniformizing parameter of K, is non-zero. And then I can also remove the point T equals zero. That's what this is. So, it's very strange. I mean, you can think of K as a punctured disk. Maybe K is isomorphic itself to this field, and then it's this punctured disk over FQ. This also is a punctured disk over FQ. When I cross them together, I can view the result in two ways. It's a punctured disk over one field, or it's a punctured disk over the other field. And this strange interplay of what's the variable and what's the scalars is, like, extremely common in this, ma in this matter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so that completes uh, our first section. Uh, is it right if I use this backboard? Does that represent difficulties? Okay. All right, so section two will be called diamonds. <laughs> okay. Diamonds and everything in this section is due to Schulze. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, the idea is that if... Let's suppose I attended to carry out the same local program where U is replaced by SPA QP. <laughs> um, then I run into problems right away. So the main issue is what am I crossing these things over? So if S is some attic space, maybe it's an attic space over QP, I really want to cross these things over some base 
um, in some way which doesn't collapse the two things together. So SPA QP cross SPA QP over SPA QP is just SPA QP. I get one point. I don't get anything interesting. Really, what I'd like to do is take the fiber product of these two things over something like F1, over some deeper base. OK, so this is nonsense, so I don't, I don't really know how to do it. So this is just one obstruction to carrying these things, carrying this program out in character 6.0. Um, all right. But uh, all right, so since we now have perfectoid spaces, though, um, this suggests the following strategy, which is to, OK, things are in character 6.0, pass to some highly ramified cover where things become perfectoid, and then take the tilt, and then you're in characteristic P. And then once you're in characteristic P, go ahead and cross the things over FP. That makes sense. So um, just so the strategy here is to pass to very ramified covers. Well, I should really say perfectoid cover. And then tilt. So this process carried out for just the field QP results in the following progression. So passing to a perfectoid cover, well, you can do whatever you like, but here's a convenient one. If you adjoin to QP all the roots of unity, all p-power roots of unity, and then complete that. So that's a perfectoid field. Um, when this is tilted, it results in a perfectoid field in characteristic P. That perfectoid field is FP T1 on P infinity. OK. Um, now, this extension was Galois, and the group is uh, ZP cross. So when we pass to this cover, let's remember that we have that action. And that action presents as an action of ZP cross on this field. And that action is just it's very simple. It's just T. It substitutes T for 1 plus T to the A minus 1. So it's this formula of, that comes from like phi gamma modules. OK. And now we're in characteristic P, and the idea is then to plug this into whatever you're going to do here. OK. Um, right. Uh, so in other words, I should think of SPA QP as this very stacky quotient, SPA FP T1 on P infinity modulo the action of ZP cross. OK. OK. So I said this uh, phrase stacky quotient. So that suggests that this thing should really be a sheaf. But a sheaf on what category? It'll be a category of perfectoid spaces in characteristic P. OK. So oh, right. I OK. So why don't I just continue writing here? OK. So let's let perf, I don't know, <laughs> be the category of perfectoid spaces in characteristic P. OK. And uh, what's important is that I don't, I don't insist on having any particular base field. I mean, the definition of a perfectoid space usually starts like, to let K be a perfectoid field, and then I do the following things. But there's no specified base field here. OK. All right, so this is a category. And it has a topology on it, which is the pro et al topology. So it's like the et al topology, but I allow the et al covers, I allow kind of in, 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 inductive limits in them. So, um, OK, here's this definition. Uh, diamond is a sheaf on perf, a sheaf of sets. OK, but I don't want them to be too crazy. They should really come from something Perfectoid. It should be like a quotient of something that actually is representable by a perfectoid space. So I require that they that this admitting that this admit a surjection from something representable. Also, what? Ah, a pro etalsive. 
pro-HL surjection. Ah, I see. So the surjection only needs... Oh, but that's sort of tautological, right? Because it's on this topology. So, I mean, the surjection of sheaves is all local anyway. But for emphasis, uh, okay. Pro-HL surjection from a representable. That's, so that says representable sheaf. Okay, right. Um, where the basic example you should have in mind is this quotient here. Um, so let's examine what this thing is as a sheaf on the category of perfectoid spaces. So just this one. And now I regret having <laughs> now I regret having used the backboard. But oh no no no! But there's a solution. What if I put it all the way up? Great. And now is that board visible? Great, great. So I can erase this. So what I want to do is take this particular example of Spa QP. And so, um, so just for the moment, I'll define this ad hoc diamond, Spa QP, and I put a little diamond here to denote that it's in this category of diamonds, to be just this quotient I put up there on the top board. Now, okay. Um, so this quotient is to be taken as a sheaf on perf. So let's see what happens to a perfectoid space S. So let's, in particular, just have it be an affinoid perfectoid. So it's spa R plus perfectoid. Um, so this means in particular that R is a perfect Bonnach algebra that uh, has to be very ramified. Um, then what is uh, Homs? Well, yeah, okay, let me call this thing U so then I can be consistent with earlier notation, okay? So if U is this thing, then what are the U points of, what are the S points of U? Well, you'll get something like this. Okay, so it's going to be like Homs from this field into this R, which are continuous. But then I have to mod up by this action. Um, okay, what's this going to be? So this is completely determined by where T goes, because R is already perfect. So, um, but T is topologically nullpotent, so it has to go to something topologically nullpotent here. I'm going to denote the uh, set of topologically nullpotent elements by R double zero. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> there's a really great interpretation of what this actually is. So, U of S is naturally the same as the set of til untilts of this S into characteristic zero. So a morphism to Spa QP diamond is the same thing as an untilt. That is a lift of the thing to characteristic zero whose tilt is this. So U of S is going to be the set of, well, I'll call it R sharp, right? So this is going to be a perfectoid algebra in characteristic zero. Um, together with an isomorphism of R sharp flat. <laughs> Musically, these things should cancel. It's just R. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yes. Oh, uh, great. Good question. So the question was, what is the action of ZP cross on R double zero? And the answer is by the same formula I wrote down, which is all the way up there, but it's valid because T is top, because the image of, yeah, because elements of R double zero are topologically nullpotent, so that formula makes sense. Okay, all right. All right, so how does this work? Um, so the construction is really due to Farg and Fontan. In the case where R is CP, say, CP tilt. But it works generally. And um, I'll just sketch it. So, um, so this R double zero thing is the same as this inverse limit 
of GM of R. So it's just R cross. Um, just <laughs> where the isomorphism is just add one. <laughs> and this is an isomorphism of uh, ZP modules, where the ZP action is up there. And so if we have some, uh, so if we have something here, um, oh, maybe it should be R plus. Uh, okay, maybe these are just almost the same. So I mean, if you have an element uh, x in here, the idea, okay, I mean, the idea is to do something like this. So this element x has to pass to something in character 6, 0. All right, so this is just a sketch of how this works, but let's suppose I took, uh, yeah. So r is a perfect ring, so so is r plus. I can do something like this. And I want to mod out by something which reminds you of this element t from Piatic Hodge theory. So it's going to be like the logarithm of x, of the Teichmuller element, logarithm of x. Okay. Okay, but this is not the way that Fargan von Ten set it up. Um, but I wanted to do something which reminded you of the isomorphism. Sorry, this is b Chris plus. In this classical situation, uh, where you have this theta map to CP, that's what this thing is supposed to be. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry to be imprecise here, but um, the point is that morphisms to Spa QP diamond parameterize lifts to character six zero. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Farg is not so happy with this. <laughs> okay. The way that, do you like to me to say something? Do you have a comment? Oh, okay, okay, okay. But then, um, I said, but then I have to define what this is, and I don't want this problem with being a good expositor and also. <laughs> but now it sounds correct. Yeah, which is more important to be correct or to be uh, understood? So fine, there's this mysterious thing, B plus. If you've read, if you've studied Farc Fontaine, and you should, but <laughs> this is this B plus which appears. And now it's something a little bit closer to being correct. <laughs> More comments? It's not the what? Oh, no, it's not the logarithm of a Teichmuller of x. It's not? Oh, that's right, you need to do this thing. Okay, so I mean, all right, so it's more complicated than anything I could possibly write down in time. So I sort of, this really does need to be corrected, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, I understand. Okay, I understand. I'm sorry. So, um, okay. All right, what's going to happen with this? Ah, so. Ah, right, so I just gave you some analysis of what Spa QP diamond is, but I just gave an ad hoc definition of it. So what does it mean to add this diamond to something? So there's a functor from classical rigid spaces to diamonds, which is important for us. So there is a functor from rigid spaces over QP to category of diamonds. Okay, so this will be written U goes to U diamond. <laughs> um, shock, yeah. Okay, so ah, so this uses the fact that in the Proital topology, everything can be covered by perfectoid spaces. So, uh, what does this mean? So I need to give you some interpretation of this thing as a sheaf on this category perf. So let's do the following thing. So what we have to do to make this thing happen is to construct a Proital cover. which I want to do with a minimum of notation. So I'll just write something like this. So uh, 
OK. So maybe u0 is a cover of u in the topological sense. <laughs> and then ui is going to be a etal cover of u0. And then this inverse limit thing okay, is ui. And I want to do this in such a way that when I take u tilde, being the completion of the inverse limit of these guys, I get something perfectoid. Hmm. All right, so if u is like spa qp, then u tilde is like spa qp mu p infinity completed. Okay. Um, very good. But then I also want to remember the fact that this came from u. So I need some kind of way to descend u tilde down to u. But this is just going to be like a descent datum. If I take u tilde cross u tilde over u, then of course there are two projections onto u tilde. And this induces an equivalence relation on any s, on any s points of this. on u tilde of s, where s is any object in perf. Okay, that equivalence relation would be if, okay, ob image of these, t of, an, of a point here, and these two guys here, these two guys would be equivalent, because they would map to the same point in u, right? So, um, okay, so now what is u diamond? u diamond of s, where s is in perf, is going to be u tilde of s, modulo whatever that equivalence relation is. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to do this. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, all right, so it induces the equivalence relation on this. Um, these are both perfectoid spaces, so you can tilt them. Oh, I forgot to tilt. That was part of the strategy. <laughs> tilt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so it's something like this. And um, in the particular situation where there's a Galois cover of U, which is perfectoid, then there's going to be a group G here. I mean, this would, if the, perhaps it's a torsor with group G, and then this is just going to be U tilde across G, and then this is going to be a quotient by a group action, which is exactly the case that happened for Spock UP. You could do it also for, um, for U being, oh, I don't know, um, a rigid disk. Okay, so this is a classical rigid closed unit disk. And then what would the right choice for util to be? Well, you need to get something perfectoid. So you need to take, so you can do, for instance, p roots of unity, but then also p roots of t. But if I want it to be pro etal, what I'd better do is do plus or minus one here. Okay, so this is going to be more like an annulus. Okay, so I'll do mu p infinity here. Okay, this is notationally a bit burdensome. And then, <laughs> and the integral version of this. Like so. And in that case, this is a pro etal cover of U, where there's a group G here, which would be, um, uh, what would it be? So, ZP cross, semi-direct product, uh, now the action on the t's is by roots of unity, so mu p infinity there. Okay. Okay. Zp. Yeah, sorry. It's the, t the Tate module of this. I'm sorry. I'll just write it as Zp. Actually, why don't I write it as Zp of one? Because that's what it is. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, um, what is u diamond? So u diamond evaluated on s would be the tilt of that guy, of uh, the s points of that module of the action of that group. All right. All right, so the moral here is that a diamond is a perfectoid space in characteristic P, modulo some equivalence relation, which in practice often comes from a group. Okay, okay 10 minutes. Um. All right, so the next order of business is to, um, I'll just tell you about Drinfeld's lemma, how it plays out for the point spa QP diamond. Oh, 
Oh, certainly not. So on the left, so the question is, is the functor an equivalence of categories? And certainly not, because diamonds contains the category for factoid spaces, and rigid spaces cannot reach these. <laughs> rigid spaces are a finite type. That's right. Mm -hmm. It turns what morphisms into isomorphisms? It turns universal homeomorphisms into isomorphisms. So, um, ah, right. So the moral of Peter's comment was that the diamond only remembers topological information. And one other useful thing he said, I won't get it all, is that um, rigid spaces are over QP. So the image of this functor lands in really diamonds together with a map to spa QP diamond. So this information is, uh, ah. Ah, OK, OK. How does that answer his question, though? <laughs> Yes. Yes, so this functor regarded as a cat is really it's just like rigid space over QP to diamonds over spot QP diamond. And it um, on normal rigid spaces, it's a fully faithful functor. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right, so this next theorem is uh, Drinfeld's lemma for this base spot QP diamond. So ah, it's just this. So <laughs> So basically, I'm going to write down the same thing I did for, OK. <laughs> so the category of, OK. So first of all, this product exists in the category of diamonds, but it just now we have a base for it. It'll just be FP, sorry. Um, and finite etal covers of U cross U, which are Frobenius cross U equivariant. Uh, OK. These are the same as pairs of finite tall covers of U. Yeah, great. Okay. okay, so this is exactly the analog of Drinfeld's lemma for the space Spa QP diamond. Okay, all right. So, not much time, but the proof of this involves the Farg Fontaine curve, and now this is the reason why I reserved X. <laughs> X, uh, but in fact, there's a attic avatar of X, which I'll need. And what is X attic? So in a way, it's like it's the P, uh, mm, char mixed characteristic analog of this punctured unit disk that I wrote down earlier in the lecture. So I can actually write down what it is. So I'll start with a formal scheme. So. Um, OK, so CP, this will be uh, algebraically closed, complete extension of QP. When I take its tilt, it's now a perfectoid field in characteristic P. This has a ring of integers, which is a perfect ring. The ring of VIT vectors is now some ZP algebra. I can take the formal scheme associated to it. Uh, it has an attic space. This thing is fibered over SPA ZP, so I can take the generic fiber. Uh, but maybe I'll just be clear on what I'm doing here. Fiber over SPA QP. And then, uh, so I've sort of, I've <laughs> yeah, it's this kind of twice punctured thing. I'm moving two across two disks, and I have to remove both axes. I moved one axis, which is absolute value of P equals 0, and I have to remove the other. So I'll just, I'll just say something like this. But this, this 0 means that uh, removing 0 is like imposing the condition that if var pi is a what do you call it? Quasi-uniformizer? It's not a uniformizer. Pseudo-uniformizer <laughs> of OCP flat, then uh, I, I demand that this is not zero. Okay. All right, so this is the farg fontaine curve. And uh, no, it's not yet. <laughs> Sorry. And then I have to mod out by. So Frobenius, p power Frobenius acts on CP tilt. So it acts on this entire structure. So I mod out by this. Um, uh, what is this? Okay. 
Okay. So the idea now. Um, Ah. Oh, okay. All, all right. <laughs> but I don't have to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the proof of this theorem involves like a lemma. Um, so it goes like this, so let's take Spa QP diamond and cross it with Spa CP diamond in the category of diamonds and um, mod this out by one cross Frobenius. Do this right. And then this is the same as the Farg Fontaine curve. Diamond. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So this is a uh, ah yeah. So this is really lovely because now it's sort of the Farg Fontaine curve is uh, so extremely natural in this category of diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, all right. So I can sketch the proof of this. So let's consider what this product has to be. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so this is supposed to remind you of this calculation I did earlier in the equal characteristic case. So I want you to think of spa QP diamond as the quotient of spa FP T1 over P infinity. Um, okay, then I cross this with, okay, but CP is already, so I have to remember the ZP star action, so I'll write it in just a second. Um, cross spa Z. So CP is already a perfectoid field, so I, I don't. I just need to tilt it. Um, modulus action of ZP cross, and ZP cross is operating on the variable T. Okay, and now I'm crossing together two perfectoid fields in characteristic P. So this should remind you of what I did earlier. What I get is this punctured unit disk over CP tilt, um, except it's not quite the punctured disk because T has all these roots of unity. So what I'll do is I'll write this as d tilde of CP tilt punctured, where so d CP tilt is this open disk, and d CP tilts with the tilde is this inverse limit over the Frobenius maps. Uh, no, no, no. I want to be more precise about that. Um, it's the inverse limit over t goes to t to the p of this guy. So t is the parameter on this open disk. So this is the limit of a bunch of covers, which are a tall away from zero. So it's this. That's what this is. So it's a, this. So as a diamond, this product is the punctured perfectoid disk over CP tilt. Yeah. What? Mod ZP star, because I forgot to write that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. awesome. okay. um, and then I can write this also as the generic fiber of a formal scheme. So that would be, the formal scheme would be spoof of OCP tilt brackets T1 over P infinity. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll have to erase this part. Um, take the attic generic fiber and remove zero. And then mod out by this thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's what this product is. Uh, if I were to uh, mod this out by one cross phi, the phi is operating on the CP flat here. So it's phi this cross phi, and this cross phi. Okay. All right. Now, uh, on the other side, let's just calculate the diamond of x add. Uh, 
ah, oh, yeah, it occurs to me this is not exactly right. This is sort of off by a for some kind of absolute Frobenius, which I don't really care about. But on the other side, um, all right, so how do we compute x add? So x add is this attic space over here. It's, uh, to get it to be a diamond, you need to pass to some perfectoid cover. So let's just tensor the thing with a perfectoid field, like the cyclotomic one, and then tilt it. But then we have to mod out by zp cross again. So, so x add diamond ends up being, um, all right. So what I'll do is I'll just take my w of OCP tilt, and then I'll just tensor it over zp with zp mu p infinity completed, add a generic fiber, and remove zero. Um, but then I need to tilt this, <laughs> so, uh, and then mod out by the Galois group. And I don't have room to write this. That's unfortunate. So I'll just say tilt mod zp star. OK. And for Benius, because I forgot that also. So here we go. Um, all right, so the tilting process. Well, um, tilting is like, on, on, in, in this formal scheme, it manifests as modding out by p and then taking an inverse limit under the Frobenius maps. So when you do this to a vit ring, you just get whatever's inside, because it was already perfect. When you do it to this, we get fp double brackets t1 over p infinity. So this results in spf of OCP tilt double brackets t1 over p infinity. Um, yeah, add a generic fiber. Yeah, mud out by cp cross and also phi. Ah, but I forgot to remove zero. There's that. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's some apologies that it's notationally very cumbersome. But is it, do they match? <laughs> they match, okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I can almost I can now finish with the proof of the theorem. So, well, I won't, it won't be a complete proof, but it gives you an idea. So, um, we now use this input from Fargan Fontaine, which is that the Farg Fontaine curve is geometrically uh, simply connected. So. So x add is geometrically simply connected. OK, which means that, um, so if I were to take a finite tall cover of x add, that's equivalent to just taking a finite tall cover of QP itself. So finite tall QP algebras. Okay, so this tells us about finite tall covers of the right-hand side of this. So it tells us that phi equivariant finite tall covers of this product are the same as finite tall covers of QP. So this object, spa QP diamond, cross spa CP diamond, Ah, so it's finite etal covers, which are w equivariant under partial Frobenius, are the same as QP finite etal here. Okay, because after all, they're the same in the category of diamonds. So um, we're almost finished. The theorem was about spa QP cross spa QP, not spa QP cross spa CP. When you go, when you descend this from spa CP to spa QP, you get uh, this other action of Gal the Galois group of QP bar over QP. So basically, uh, yeah. Ah, um, yeah. So this at least shows you that pi one. Yeah, if I do this kind of thing where I talk about, I hope this is not too confusing. If I talk about, no, no, no wrong way. If I talk about the one cross phi fundamental group of pi one of something, what, what?
No, 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 because this is a much, much simpler thing to understand. <laughs> These are simply the, simply the category of finite tall covers of the field QP. So the fundamental group here is just the Galois group of QP. It's much simpler. No diamonds involved there. Okay. So, um, uh, you know what? Why don't I just write this object here? Okay. Pi 1, I'll just make this simpler. Pi 1 of the quotient spa QP cross spa CP mod 1 cross V uh, to the Z. This is just the Gala group of QP bar of a QP. What is GQP? Okay. Uh, phi is an automorphism of this thing, so I'm, I can actually take this quotient in the category of diamonds. Okay. Um, now when I descend the picture down to QP from here, this tells me that pi 1 of spa QP cross spa QP mod one, plus 1 cross phi to the z. Well, this is the thing that I was interested in in the first place, because this classifies finite et al covers of this product with an action of partial Frobenius, which are partial Frobenius equivariant. And this tells me that this group here is an extension of GQP by GQP. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this, <laughs> there's this fundamental group. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, yeah. So then the, the rest is just showing that this fundament, that this exact sequence splits. Okay. S which I won't say anything about. I mean, F oh, is it, is it completely obvious that it should split? Oh, because there's another subgroup, oh, of course, there's another subgroup of it coming from the fact that the situation is completely symmetric. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay. Uh, so the splits by symmetry. By symmetry? <laughs> All right. All right, so then we have the lemma. All right. So I'll just say a comment that it is, so this at least indicates that it would be possible to carry out Drinfeld and Laforgue's program for Stuka's in the characteristic zero context. You can already write down a definition. I mean, Farag has made some work in this, in this arena where you can write a definition of a Stuka in characteristic zero as a kind of modification of vector bundles on the farag fenton curve with certain data about how that modification works, the zeros and poles. And uh, this lemma says that in theory, if you have a robust enough theory of moduli of such stukas, then you could get Galois representations over QP. Thanks. Okay. Yeah.